What are signaling molecules? Well, signaling molecules are just communication molecules. They are molecules released by one cell to communicate with another cell, to send a signal to another cell. Um, so a hormone is a type of signaling molecule. Uh, but uh, there are other types of signaling molecules that we will talk about when we get to the nervous system. Um, and we were talking about hormones. And so we're talking about hydrophilic hormones and hydrophobic hormones. Um, and this hydrophobic hormone could be thyroid hormone, could be uh, aldosterone, could be testosterone. And the advantage of being a hydrophobic hormone is not so much in getting from where you were made to where you'll have your effect. Because for that, you had to ride around on a little protein raft, hydrophilic protein. But the advantage is once you get to the cell, you're allowed to walk right into the cell because you are a small hydrophobic molecule. You're allowed to go right into the cell. You, if, you, if you find your receptor protein, then you'll bind to that receptor protein and then together you can affect how genes are transcribed and thus which proteins and how much protein are made. Right? So if this were testosterone, and this was a cell of my hair follicle, then by entering into that cell, it will tell that cell, hey, let's make thicker, darker hair, and I would have thicker, darker hair on my arms, right? But it might go right through my cornea. My cornea doesn't care if I'm male or female, right? So the cells of my cornea, nah, just goes right on through them. Now, let's talk about the hydrophilic hormones the water-soluble hormones. I'm sorry, you kind of can't see this. It says water-soluble hormones dissolve in the watery part of the blood. Sorry. Um, so that is the advantage of being a hydrophilic hormone, a hormone like insulin. Really easy for you to get from where you started to where you're going because you just dissolve in water. Everywhere there's water, which is pretty much everywhere in the body, that's where you go. The disadvantage is you will not be allowed, boink, boink, you will not be allowed to go into the cell. So how will you affect the cell? You will affect the cells by working through second messengers. You need a cell surface receptor. Let's go back here. When they get to their target cells, they get stopped at the membrane. So they need, here we've got these navy blue Vs. Those represent the receptor proteins or receptors for this hydrophilic hormone. And if those are working properly, then as soon as the hormone binds, then it will start off a chain of events that will end up causing the cell to do something, right? So if you're a hydrophobic hormone, you are like Beyonce at the Grammys, okay? You need a big old fancy limo to get there and a whole bunch of bodyguards and stuff like that. But once you get there, you walk right on in, okay? Um, if you're a hydrophilic hormones, you're like me at the Grammys. It's really easy for me to get there. I just hop in my car and go. I don't need a posse, but I do not get to go into the Grammys. I get stopped at the door. And if I've got a message for Beyonce, I have to leave it to the guy at the door who, who hopefully gives it to someone who gives it to someone who gives it to someone who ultimately gives it to Beyonce. Second messengers. By either method, the end result is often a change in gene transcription. Often. There we go. Okay. All righty. So here's the image from your textbook. Uh, steroid hormones, actually also thyroid hormone. Uh, it is a good size molecule, but goes right on, right on into the cell, like Beyonce at the Grammys, right? Now, in order to have any effect on the cell, it still needs to bind to its receptor protein molecule and form a complex. Together, they can actually change which gene is being transcribed and how much and how much of that protein is being made by translation, right? So which gene is being transcribed, messenger RNA, translated, more protein, right? So those are the hydrophobic hormones. Are these hydrophobic hormones going through all of my cells? Yes, but if this was my eyeball cell, 
then it would not find a receptor for testosterone. So it would have no effect on that cell. Hydrophilic hormones, if this looks complicated to you, this is so ridiculously simplified. These second messenger systems are really, really complicated and they're called signaling pathways. So we're gonna simplify it even more. All of the non-steroid hormones, all of the hydrophilic hormones like insulin, they never go into the cell. They never enter the cell at all. They are stopped at the cell membrane and the cell membrane needs to have some kind of a receptor protein so that when that hormone binds, it'll be like a, like a key going into a lock and that'll cause this to move, which causes that to move, which causes that to move. And we're just gonna call all of that stuff second messengers. Hydrophilic hormones act by second messengers. All right, so let's answer a question. Which of the following statements about steroid hormones is not true? Which one is false? All right. Um, so pause me while you look this over because I'm about to tell you the answer. Steroid hormones must be transported through the blood on special proteins. Wait a minute, that's true. Steroid hormones are hydrophobic. So, okay, not A. And if that's not true, then that is not true. Great, now I gotta find the one that is false, okay. Steroid hormones act by second. No, steroid hormones act directly. Steroid hormones include estrogen and progesterone. That's true. Steroid hormones are allowed to directly in the cell. That's true. So which one of these statements is false? B. All right. What else? Which? which? I thought I had another question. I guess I do not. Now, these are the major components of the endocrine system we will only barely touch on cells in the human body that make hormones. Mostly I'll be talking about that when we get to those organ systems. So the major components of the endocrine system, they start out with the hypothalamus. Now pay attention to this. The hypothalamus is technically a part of your endocrine system. However, it's much, much more than a part of the endocrine system. It is actually a part of your brain and the hypothalamus is made out of nerve cells. So write this down. The hypothalamus is part of the endocrine system, but it is not an endocrine gland, okay? Part of the endocrine system, not an endocrine gland, okay? But it is a part of your brain, and it's the part of your brain that links what your brain knows with the messages that your endocrine glands send out, right? Then there's the pituitary gland, also in your brain. The pituitary gland is complicated. You should know from 150 that it has an anterior component and a posterior component, right? A front part and a back part. The anterior part is glandular material. The posterior part technically made out of highly modified nerve cells. So the anterior pituitary, glandular, posterior pituitary, neural, we'll get to them. Now, uh, you will see some textbooks that say the hypothalamus is the master regulator of the endocrine system. Some that say the pituitary gland is the master regulator of the endocrine system. I will not be asking a question like that. You should know that the hypothalamus links the brain to controlling parts of the nervous system. And you should know that the way it does it is through the pituitary gland. And you should know that there are several glands who are under the control of the pituitary gland. By the way, which glands does the anterior pituitary control? The anterior pituitary mostly controls glands that make hydrophobic hormones. Hopefully we'll talk about that, okay? Then we've got all these glands and these are kind of arranged from superior to inferior, from high to low. So the pineal gland, it's your bi biological clock. It's kind of in the back part, it's, it's posterior to your thalamus, right? The thyroid gland controls your metabolic rate, how quickly your mitochondria 
are using oxygen and glucose in order to make ATP. That is being controlled by the thyroid gland. Your thymus is a part of your immune system. I, I really don't know why they always put it in the endocrine chapter, but I'm not gonna be talking about it at all in this chapter. It was my field of study, so I feel righteous indignation that they keep putting it in here, okay? And then the uh, adrenal glands, oh no, sorry, the parathyroid glands, they're on the back side of your thyroid gland, and they are particularly important for controlling calcium levels in your blood, calcium homeostasis. Your adrenal glands, they're like little tiny hats that your kidneys wear, and they do a few things. If I'm gonna generalize, I generalize by saying they release stress hormones. Your adrenal glands are also made partly out of glandular material and partly out of nerve tissue. And we'll talk about that. Your pancreas is right here, hidden behind your stomach, and it regulates the levels of sugar in your bloodstream, very important. And then your gonads, ovaries if you're female, uh, testes if you're male, uh, they release sex hormones, all right? This is a good study slide, but we're going to go into detail on all of these individual topics. And we are going to start that when we get to the next video.